let the children go to children's church this morning. This is just the most unique pet you've ever seen in a, inside of a pulpit. I, I got such a kick when uh, Rachel did a wonderful job leading service, but uh, her daughter was giving her a little brush there when she. And I also want to thank whoever left their car keys here for me. Thank you. We do need another vehicle on our family. We appreciate that. I don't know whose keys these are. Are they Justin's or they're somebody's keys, but are they yours? No, no. Somebody's going to have to need them to get home unless we uh, fire up the van and drive them home. But uh, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. Thank God for Jesus. Since the Spirit of the Lord here today, and I pray that there will be victories for those things that you prayed for, those things that are burdening your heart. You know, God does love us, and God cares for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Father, bless us today as we look at your word. Holy Spirit, be our teacher and lead and guide us into all truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If someone were to walk in this room this morning and they were to say, Therefore, everyone to whatever. You see, when it says, says therefore, there has to be a wherefore. That's what I'm getting at. And the therefore, he says, therefore be steadfast. Why? Therefore be unmovable. Why? Therefore always abound in the work of the Lord. Why? We have to look at what's being said just prior to that. And if we look at uh, verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I saw one time in a magazine I was reading that this church over their nursery had this scripture. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's kind of a little appropriate thing. How about it? Kind of a cute thing. But we shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die, but we all shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye that quick, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I always read this scripture whenever I do a funeral, especially if there's a graveside committal. I always encourage uh, people when I'm going to do a funeral, let's, let's go to the graveside because there's some important things that we say there. Now, if they don't want to do it, I don't pitch a fit or anything like that. I just work it into what we're doing at the church or at the funeral home. But I like this, the rest of the scriptures. For this corruptible, and this decaying body, must put on incorruption. <coughs> and this mortal must put on immortality. I am mortal. I will die. I don't like that. I'm not wild about death. I like what comes after death. But there's an unknown there, isn't there? Death is an enemy. Albeit an enemy that the Lord Jesus has defeated. But then he goes on to say, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, that new glorified body, that eternal body, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, therefore, because of that, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The apostles were preachers of the cross. I have heard people say, theologians or teachers or preachers or maybe even just church people, but I've heard it said that we need to tone down this stuff about the cross. Well, that wasn't the early apostles. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, for, he said to the Corinthians, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, the Corinthians were in a Mecca 
of great intellectualism and great philosophies. Nothing, no philosophy, no intellectualism can stand the greatness of the cross. People don't necessarily need a new philosophy. People, you know, I hear people say, I guess it's true, but I, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you strong. Well, that was Nietzsche. I'd rather quote Jesus. I'd rather quote that he strengthens me in everything. That he's a very present help in the time of need. We believe in the cross. It's important that we as believers understand what happened at the cross. That he defeated sin, death, and Satan all at the cross. The serpent from the book of Genesis. Remember what it said about the serpent? The serpent would bruise the heel of the woman's seed, but the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. So when Paul went to Corinth, he said, I didn't teach you the great philosophies of the Greek philosophers. I didn't give you the great philosophies of the world. I, I'm not sure. I don't like to be judgmental. I don't like to pick on stuff, but I listened to some preaching. Whether, you know, I, I, on Facebook, I get these live streams of preachers, and sometimes you hear them on radio. And I'm wondering if, if we in the church haven't slipped into this self-help stuff so much that we've forgotten that our help and strength is in a crucified, resurrected Savior. They were preachers of the cross, and they were preachers of the resurrection. If a few verses back in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, and verse 12, he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you there is no resurrection of the dead? We believe Jesus is coming. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a few moments. But whether I'm dead or alive at the time of the rapture, I still benefit from it because the dead in Christ shall rise. There is a resurrection. The Sadducees in Jesus' day did not believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> we believe something happens after this life. I, I, from a child up, I, I've always wondered what happens next. It's, it's ingrained in us. How, why is it that we have that thought for a little while? Because the Holy Spirit has embedded that into us. It's the Holy Spirit reaching out to us from a young age to come to Christ. And then he says, verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ. Whom he, raised, whom he raised not up, if so be it that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain, and you're yet in your sins. You see, we believe in a suffering Savior on the cross. We believe in a resurrected Jesus who came out of the tomb. And coming out of the tomb, he sealed our salvation. He was delivered for our offenses, and He was raised again for our justification. Paul said in Romans. And what does justification mean? It means that the guilt, the indictment against us has been cleared. It means to, justification means just as if I had never sinned. I'm a sinner. I'm a failure. It's easy for me to sin. It just, it just comes natural to me. But in Christ, when I stand before Him, I stand not in my own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. And it's just as if I had never sinned. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. There's no hope. If, if we don't believe in a resurrection, no hope for us after we die. I, I work with people that have said to me, well, when you die, that's it. Nothing else happens. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
We are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, those that, are, that, are, that have died. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. We all fell. We believe in the fall of man. We fell when Adam fell in the garden. When I was first a Christian, a teenager, I thought, that's so unfair. This guy messed up and now we're all at this indictment against us. But then I finally in time began to realize, but it was by the righteousness of one man that I've been made righteous. He balanced the books. See, these early apostles, they were preachers of the cross, they were preachers of the resurrection, and they were also preachers of the impartation of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 19, Paul uh, goes to Ephesus. He says that it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast came to Ephesus finding certain disciples. And he said to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And you don't know then at verse 6, as Paul talked about, about uh, they said they were baptized in John's baptism. Paul talked about being baptized in Jesus. And it says, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. They were preachers of the cross, the resurrection, the impartation of the Holy Spirit. We should be seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be ye filled with the Spirit. And in the original language it means be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled and continue to be filled. And he tells us in the epistles how to do that. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know what? Why is it when we have a worship service here and we sing, we begin to feel the presence of God? We're speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And the Spirit begins to infill us. We can do that same thing at home. And then these, these apostles, they were preachers of the second coming. You know, when I was, I was saved when I was 15 and I heard a school teacher, there was a discussion in a social studies class and there were some other kids there that were Christians. And a social studies teacher uh, made the comment, someone talked about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the social studies teacher said, I've heard that my entire life. And he dismissed it. I remember saying something to my mother. And my mother said that when she was a kid, she would hear people say the same thing. People can mock the coming of Jesus. They can mock the rapture. They can mock, now there's a difference between the rapture when really the second coming, his feet touched the Mount of Olivet and it claims him too. We believe that not only is he going to come, and we'll read it here in a minute, he's going to come in the clouds and take the church out of here and he's going to raise the dead. We also believe in his physical, literal return when all eyes shall see him, and they who have pierced him shall wail because of him. When his feet touch the Mount of Olivet, and he'll begin to rule for a literal 1,000 years on earth, which is the millennium. We believe that. And because we believe that, it's all tied in with the resurrection. Because we believe that, Paul says, therefore be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In Titus 2.13 it says, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When you watch the news, do you watch it with a little bit of a, an eye in eschatology, the study of the end times? I am no expert in eschatology. I, I have no idea who the Antichrist is going to be. I don't know what he'll wear. I'm not much one for the paperback books that seem to have all the authority. But this world, and I don't know, is, that, is it because I'm getting older, or is it just becoming more and more complex and, and, and just more going after the, the evil one? <clears throat> we could spend all afternoon just talking about things of eschatology. But I, I, I'm amazed, Let's take a little sidebar real quick. A friend of mine, a man I worked with, he was the manager of our <clears throat> uh, 
uh, one of our New Jersey uh, customer service centers plants when they worked for the Suburban Propane. He was a retired, not retired, but he had left the military. He was a, an officer in the military, young man, uh, had served in Afghanistan. I saw he posted a few weeks back, maybe, maybe two months or so, of everything that's going on in Syria, who is fighting who, and who will fight with who, and who will refuse to fight with who. It is a mess. The Kurds won't fight with the, the Turks, and the, but yet they have a common enemy against ISIS, and it's just, it's very confusing. The world situation is becoming very confusing. What did Jesus say? You shall hear of wars and rumors of the wars. And what did he tell us to do? Look up for your redemption for all of time. He said to watch, to wait, and to pray. And the church needs to be motivated into prayer. We know the scripture that that, uh, that we shall not all sleep, the scripture said. But then in Thessalonians he said that the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which were alive and ready shall be caught up into the air to go off and to be with our Lord forever. See, there was a teaching going around uh, at the time and it was hitting the Thessalonican church that if you died you weren't going to be able to, there would be no resurrection of life. You had to be alive when Christ came in order to be able to go to heaven. Paul said, no, 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 that's not. That's not true. You see, these men, these apostles and Paul, when they were talking about this, these, these things here in 1 Corinthians, what he was really trying to help people understand, these verses about, uh, about the incorruptible putting on, or the, the uh, corruptible putting on incorruption, and the mortal putting on immortality, he was helping the church to understand that we need to live our life in the light of eternity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he talks about that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And in fact, Paul says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, it'll be a glad and glorious day, no doubt. But the scripture says he'll wipe away every tear also. I'm wondering if those tears are because when we stand before the judgment seat, we'll have things to cry about. I, there, there's, there's two types of fear. There's healthy fear and unhealthy fear. I have a healthy fear of laying my hand on a red hot stove burn. Healthy fear. Unhealthy fear is that I believe that the boogeyman will come out of the closet and attack me. I'm so big, no boogeyman can ever knock me down right now. There's a monster out there. An unhealthy fear would be that I, I fear leaving and going outside of my door every morning. I don't want to go outside of my door every morning, but I have to. I do it. I am also by nature lazy and don't want to work, but I work every day. But we have a healthy fear of God. And we know that we must give an account for those deeds done in our body. That we'll stand before the Lord one day. And Paul says, considering all this, be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord, living our lives in the light of eternity. So that's the wherefore. And then he talks about the therefore. He, he addresses the Corinthian church this way. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, my dear brothers, where there's compassion, there's the movement of God's Spirit. In Matthew, I'm going to read this scripture to you, Matthew chapter 14. It says about Jesus, Matthew 14, 14, and Jesus went forth, and he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sin. Jesus had such a heart for people. He was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He saw that they suffered under the failing religious hierarchy of their day. 
Remember, at the end of the great feast in John 7, he stood up and said, If any man thirst, come unto me. When, what, they were feasting for days. Jesus said, If any man still thirsty. He realized that there was more of a need in man than just the physical. There was the spiritual. He wanted to pour out his spirit on them so that out of their bellies would flow rivers of living water. And he knew under the religious structure of the day, it was never going to happen. Because of the sinfulness of the Pharisees and because the, the, there was no hope under the law. The hope would come through Christ. Compassion spurs action. I am a great admirer, and I know she was Roman Catholic. Not most Catholics do. But a great admirer of Mother Teresa, who labored tirelessly in Calcutta. And someone once said to Mother Teresa, they were questioning her about how she was able to get such loyalty out of the sisters. What, was it? what were they called? The Sisters of Mercy, I believe. How she was getting such loyalty out of these nuns. And, and these nuns, would, you know, they followed this religious order and uh, the, the habit and everything and, and where the roles of, of religious service and enrollment was declining throughout the world. And someone or a reporter said to her, how do you do this? And Mother Teresa said, I give them Jesus. And then they kept pushing her. They wanted a different answer. And she said, I give them Jesus. And finally, Mother Teresa said, I give them Jesus. There is nothing else. And that's how she ministered to the sick. It's amazing what when, when, when the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost given unto us. How that we are no longer concerned about our own things, but we're concerned about the things of others. That's the spirit of Jesus. I can't conjure that up. You know what I have found in life? And I talk to hundreds of people each week on the phone. Hundreds of people. That the vast majority of the people of this world are very self-centered. That's by nature. We are that way. And we never take responsibility. It's always someone else's fault. Why didn't you pay this claim for my patient? Because you haven't been submitting it. We haven't been receiving it. I said it four times. You, you should have it. Where did you send it? Oh, so you sent it to the wrong address. I'm sorry, we should have reached out to the mailman and told him this was the wrong address. What I'm saying is people never say, hey, you're right, I'm sorry. Rare, rare. Why is it that a man can leave his family, his children, his wife, and go off with someone else? Because they're only thinking of themselves. How can a mother leave her children or not attend to them and take care of them? Because she's self-centered, only thinking of herself. But when we have that compassion that's inbred into us by the Holy Spirit, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, and there's compassion. The early church had its problems. They had their differences. These guys didn't always agree. They, they, there was some conflict at times. It happened even before Jesus died. They, they disputed among themselves who would be greatest in the kingdom. You know, James and John's mother came to petition. Don't you love that? You wonder if those guys were embarrassed when they found that out. Mom came to petition that one would sit on the left side and one sit on the right side. They, their spirits weren't always right. Remember Jesus called the James and John uh, the sons of thunder. Wow. They had their differences, but at the end of the day, they actually liked one another. They actually worked together in the kingdom. When their dispute rose up in the books of Acts, in the book of Acts, that the Grecian widows were not being taken care of uh, as the the, uh, the Jewish widows, what did they do? They worked the problem and they solved it. Peter said, choose out among you seven men full of the Holy Ghost and of a good report. Let them attend to this man. And they worked together. And what happened out of those seven men? We saw some of them 
God worked miracles through them. It's amazing that when there's compassion, you don't have to have an education. You don't have to have uh, sanctioned by the government. You don't have to have a license to have compassion. To take care of a kid that's crying. To look at someone that maybe is not as intellectually put together as yourself and still love and care about them. The Bible says comfort the feeble-minded. To, to look at someone who's on a different social or economic uh, level than you are and not even consider that, that's such a bad. When that happens, God begins to move. When God begins, God, God will move among the people who care one for another, who care for the people outside of their church, who care for the drug addict, for the alcoholic. I'm amazed how critical this world can be. I'm not the church. Have I faced criticism within the church? Yes. We're not going to focus on that today. People will often say, I get treated better by the world than the church. Nah, I don't know about that. Let, let me tell you something. The world can be vicious, nasty, mean, and rotten. In our own community, our people who used to live in our own community lost an eight-year-old child to drowning. Did you, did you read the awful, nasty things people posted on, their fa on the Facebook pages about them? How can you do that? How can you kick someone when they're hurting? You know, the Holy Spirit, the, the paraclete, it means one who comes alongside. Aren't you glad that during times of life, the Holy Spirit has come alongside of you? When I was a volunteer chaplain at the Reading Hospital, we had a seminar one day, and the speaker was telling us that there are studies that when ministers visit a hospital room, those that stood by the bed could stand there for 15 minutes. And those who came and sat down beside the bed could be there for five minutes. And they asked patients later on, which chaplains that stayed with you the longest? And the majority of the time, they'll say, the guy that sat there. You know what? Because you're getting down and they're not. You're coming alongside of them. When you deal with people, when you work with people, when you start to be compassionate, your hands get dirty. You may be asked to do things that aren't comfortable. I visited a hospital room one day of a former pastor of a church that we had pastored. Elderly man in his 90s. Since I got there, his daughter said, will you shave me? Sure. I don't even shave myself for crying. <laughs> so I got the electric razor out. Did the best I could. He did say ouch once or twice. Sometimes you're called to do those things. But when you do that, God begins to move. If we as a church will find ways to be compassionate, sitting with someone whose spouse is dying, calling upon people. But money told me one time that another, well, in fact, he had been the assistant superintendent of the Pennsylvania Delaware District of the Assemblies of God, Brother David Owen. Brother David Owen had moved on and and was now a teacher at a Bible college in Minnesota. But he had been down south somewhere. And on his way back to Minnesota, Brother Owen went 500 miles out of his way to stop and visit Brother Money. And about a half hour into their visit in Brother Money's living room in the parsonage in Butler, Pennsylvania, Brother Money said to Brother Owen, why are you here? He said, I just wanted to sit with you this afternoon. Just wanted to visit with you. How many times do we see in the, in, the, in the scriptures how Abraham was visited by an angel? How many times do we see where Jesus visited in the homes of people? I can guarantee you, there's people that came up to Jesus. 
They weren't the cream of the crop. They weren't the top of society. But demoniacs, the halt, the lame, the sick, the blind, the children. If you're going to hold kids, you're going to get snotty, guaranteed. Yeah? 